So welcome to Taming the Wild Garden by me, Cass Turnbull, and I'm with an organization called Plant Amnesty, whose sole mission is to stop the senseless torture and mutilation of trees and shrubs caused by malpruning. A different name for this slideshow would be how to renovate an overgrown, high-visibility, native plant woodland garden but that was just a bit too much of a mouthful. We all have this vision of our native plant garden with uh, the happy wildlife visiting and making it a lovely scene for everybody. And that's how we feel when we plant it. But in not too many years, 10 to 12 to 14 years, a lot of times people feel like their landscape and the critters are taken over and they can't get out the door And there are things hanging all over the house, and you can't beat your way back out to the mailbox without a considerable amount of trouble. And so, we need to try to restore order. And that's easier said than done. There's a lot of things that keep people from restoring order to their native plant garden. And there's some things that you should just know. And one of them is nature abhors a garden. I don't know who said that, but it's true. Gardens are way too tame for wildlife, and they don't much exist that way in nature, unless maybe it's a climax forest. Nature is naturally beautiful, but you don't have a slice of nature, even though you planted a bunch of native plants because what you have is a disturbed site, which means at some point it was all, the native vegetation was taken away, the ground was dug up, uh, there's a whole bunch of uh, invading non-wanted plants trying to sneak into your yard and you're rustling around in it and so it is not actually a native plant area. It's kind of a uh, imitation of a native plant area. And uh, you will have to continue to intervene to keep it well-ordered because what's really going to happen is you plant that native plant garden and it begins to unravel. And in fact, it unravels something pretty bad. And another thing you should know is that the human eye likes things to look pretty orderly, but nature itself loves a mess. The bugs and the birds and the bees and the critters would just love it if you'd leave that tree falling over on your house and a bunch of leaves sticking in the thorny bushes and a big pile of ants here and there. But uh, that is not exactly what you were hoping for when you planted your native plant garden. And another thing is that as with regular gardens, you have overplanted. You put in too many plants, more plants than would exist in nature because you wanted it to look good and look right, right away, as opposed to planting them, every plant having enough room to grow up, you put in too many plants in too little a place. And let me tell you, everybody does that. And now it's time for you to try, 10, 15 years later, to try and restore some sense of uh, order and beauty to this native plant garden. But there are some things working against you, and that would be several unconscious beliefs, which once I say them, you will realize you have. One of them is that all the native plants are the good plants, and none of the native plants should die. And actually, you have too many native plants, and some of them will have to die, And you just need to understand that it's good to have some. It's not good to have as many as you have. And in many cases, a lot of the native plants that you planted propagated way out of scale to with what you're looking for. Another thing that I have found when I start to renovate people's overgrown gardens, native plant gardens, is they like it to look a little bit messy and a little bit shaggy. And, you know, that's okay. I like it to look that way, too. But what you have is too much. It's really way too overgrown and messy. You can take out tons and tons of material and still have that natural sort of free-form natural look without it being too much like the jungle that you can't get through without a machete. And the third thing that people believe, which just isn't true, is that if you were a really good pruner, you could prune everything back to the way it was when you first planted it and everything would be small and orderly again, and it's simply not true. 
plants need to grow. And when you planted your yard, everything was a baby. You get plants from the nursery. That's why it's called the nursery is everything's a baby. And they all grow to what was ever on the plant tag. And, you know, when you get it home, you kind of look at the plant tag and you kind of think that's how it's going to be in 30 years. And if it gets that to be that big, well, we can just prune it back. And it's not true. Whatever's on that plant tag is how big it's going to be in just like five or six years. And it continues to grow. That isn't its ultimate size. That's just its average size. And the thing that you will find out about pruning is it's not good for size reduction. The harder you prune, the faster plants grow. And before we go on, I want to talk about different words that we use to describe the plants in your garden. Maybe you're designing your garden, or maybe you already have it. And when you hear other native plant gardeners talk about plants, you need to understand what they're talking about. If somebody says something is choice, that just means it's really great and it's well-loved by everybody and it's beautiful. Well-behaved means that it isn't going to have babies or spread or have an ugly period in its life. So we like choice, well-behaved plants. If somebody describes a plant as spreading, a little red exclamation point should pop up in your head because sometimes these are very difficult to control. Sometimes they spread with underground roots, sort of like grass does, except this would be uh, an overground plant that would spread with underground roots, or sometimes it just goes to seed and have babies all over, and you have way more of them in your yard than you would like to have. So uh, you want to pay close attention if somebody says that a plant spreads. And then you really want to pay attention if somebody says it's vigorous or successful. That means that sometimes it can be trouble, and you need to have a lot of land before you put in a vigorous or successful plant And uh, you might want to forgo those until you know your way around native plants a lot more. And the alarm bells and sirens, whoop, 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 should be going off if anybody calls your plant very successful because that's code for invasive. And these are the plants that if you get them in your yard, they can take over. And, you know, a lot of our native plants are invasive because they like it here. They grew up here. And uh, if you were to introduce them now and they behave that way, they would be considered aggressive interlopers. But because they live here naturally, they get a pass because, you know, this is their native habitat. And uh, you do not want to use very successful plants unless you are a restoration ecologist and you have 100,000 feet of wet bank that you want to keep from eroding. And also, I want you to pay really close attention to that plant tag because everybody downsizes things in their mind. Here's a list of plants that I found on a native plant list that says it grows 10 feet. And, you know, that's way taller than you. These are all Pacific Northwest plants, but you probably have a list of similar plants wherever you are if you're not here. But if you are in the Pacific Northwest, here are some of our locals. Hazelnuts get 10 feet tall. And, you know, if it's 10 feet tall, it's probably 8 to 10 feet wide, and it has babies all throughout your landscape. So even though it's kind of a pretty plant and it has hazelnuts on it, except the squirrels get them all, even though it's a pretty plant, uh, you have to be careful. It does. You may have more in your yard than you want. Service berry, which is an amelanchier, it's really kind of a small tree. And even something that's considered a shrub like a red twig dogwood, well, it gets 10 feet tall. You know, that's really big. It's, you know, bigger than your refrigerator, bigger than two refrigerators put together. And ocean spray, that's another one of our native plants, gets that big Indian plum, nine bark, elderberry, lots of things. And then you have what's called your medium shrubs, and these are only five to ten feet, but think of five feet as your sister, somewhere between your sister and a refrigerator, Things that you might consider smaller, things like tall Oregon grape can get way tall, mock orange, red currants, nutka rose, my heavens. And, you know, nutka roses will spread underground, so you have to be careful that you have plenty of room for those. Huckleberries, I think of something about waist high, but they can get up to your shoulders. And salmonberry, which uh, although it is a perfectly nice plant in its place, 
I am recommending that you do not plant this in your yard because it will take over. I have seen salmon berries take over fields and forests and be very difficult to get rid of. So to be admired in the woods, not so much next to your front door. Trillium. This is a nice little flower, or uh, not a shrub, and it's very small, and every garden needs one. It is choice and well-behaved, and it will slowly increase and is a little bit hard to get established, especially our native one, but, you know, every garden needs a trillium. Here's a bunch berry. It's actually a little ground cover that's a dogwood. Isn't that the darlingest thing you have ever seen? Well, these are choice and difficult to establish. I've killed plenty of them, and yet they run rampant in the woods. So you want to try some in your garden, and you want to have a lot of lower story plants. If you're planting a native plant garden, you don't really want very many trees or shrubs because they get huge. You want to pack it with things that get only knee high or lower, and a few trees and shrubs, not tons. Red huckleberry. There's a nice plant. It's well-behaved. I'm not sure if it's choice. I really love mine. And they grow in the woods of the Pacific Northwest, and they actually grow on a lot of stumps. So if you cut down a tree in your landscape, you might want to uh, chainsaw a pocket in the top and stick in a red huckleberry and let it grow there because that's where it wants to live. And it has these sweet little red berries on it, and it kind of fires up in the fall, and that's a good medium-sized plant. Evergreen huckleberry. There's another medium to large plant, and it's great because it's evergreen, and it's got tinted leaves, and it has berries that you can eat, and it's well-behaved. It's a little gawky in its younger years, but it fills in later. Everybody should probably have an evergreen huckleberry in their native plant garden. Red elderberry. Now, that's one of your big boys. That's your 10 to 13-foot range, and it has red berries, although you can get the blue elderberry, as in elderberry wine, and uh, I enjoy watching those in the woods. Mock orange. Now, there's something the size of an outdoor shed, and it smells sweet, and we have a native one. I always thought the mock oranges were like, you know, from England, and they would live in Sherwood Forest or something. But, hey, it turns out we have some right here in the Pacific Northwest, and they do spread around the yard. If you have one, you might have more. And when you have more than you want, you want to dig them up and throw them away before they get big. More is not necessarily better. But a mock orange is a sweet thing. <laughs> I mean that literally. Sweet thing to have in your garden. Ocean spray, another huge plant. And uh, it also will have, you'll have more than you want if you have uh, one of these. If you have a huge property, you might want to stick an ocean spray someplace that you can see it in the spring when it looks like this, but you don't want to see it later. In the early spring, it has this really frilly, lacy-looking burble on it. That's another technical term from plant amnesty. But later, it will get water-soaked and turn this dingy brown. It looks just like some old dish rag hanging out on your bushes. So you want it someplace that it looks nice when it's in, in bloom, and you can drive by it and not watch it afterwards. And then you have things like salal. This is hard to get started, and then it's hard to stop. So if you have a large expanse that you want to fill, plant salal, baby it along, put in little bits, wait till it catches hold, and then ignore it. Do not put this in with your other plants like your trilliums and your sword ferns because it will eventually swallow it up. Nutka rose is a pretty sweet wild rose, but it can be vigorous. Do we remember what vigorous? It can be successful, maybe very successful. You remember what that means. It's a coded message. Here it is. It gets big. By big, I mean eight feet. And here's a snowberry. It has these cool little, like, popcorn white balls on it. It is successful, vigorous, and sometimes very successful. It will form a thicket. So it might be the perfect thing to put with your 
red osier dogwood on a clay bank that receives no water and you need something to hold up the bank, but do not put that in the cute little space next to your front door unless that's where you want everywhere because it will spread with underground and overground runners. Somebody I know called it Northwest Bamboo. Vancouveria, this is one of my favorites. It looks like Epimedium, Epimedium's little baby brother. It has this little inside-out flower, and the leaves just kind of float on the air, and it's very tiny and delicate. But it can also be successful, sometimes a little too successful. I have it in my garden, and I have it well-matched with some wild bleeding heart, which it lives happily with, and some sword ferns, which it can compete with. But I would not have this with any other little tiny delicate things because it would just swamp them out. So the trick to planting a native plant garden, or any garden for that matter, is put all the thugs together and put all the little babies, the little wimpy ones, together so that uh, they play nicely with each other. This is what I mean by the little inside-out flower. Isn't that darling? This is Meanthemum, or false lily of the valley. It is a thug. It looks kind of like a little baby hosta, and I, I really love the leaf. Uh, i got to say, I have put it in my invasives section of my yard, and uh, I'm watching it duke it out, and I'm very pleased with it. You may have to be careful where you plant it. It's living happily with the wild bleeding heart, which uh, has this beautiful little pink dingle dangle on it. Salmonberry. Don't plant salmonberry. Stay away from salmonberry. Salmonberry, really too successful. It will form a thicket in your woods. I have seen it take every square inch of land for itself then spread down to the fields, then over to the ponds. So, um, like I said, something to enjoy when you see it in nature. Don't import one to your house.